Thanks for the admission. Sorry for the admission. Um, I forget I'm going to talk about pulling your backs. Uh, with a little bit of a, a bend to it. Um, so of it is, um, if you guys don't know, uh, Craig is also, I would consider to be a red teamer, right? As the lingo goes, there's a lot of religious conflicts on the naming and the explanation of what anyone does here. Uh, by tree, I would, I would put myself on the other side of the fence and be, you know, blue team. Everybody's blue team, just FYI, so, you know, it's, it's cool. Um, and um, we had uh, some, yeah, some quick things on the sort of why you're here. Um, yeah, a little bit of this earlier, but basically the whole deal for you is to, is for you to really, you know, get together with people and do work and um, learn some things and try out stuff and maybe break some things, um, build some new friendships, and maybe hopefully take some things away from these sides that either inspires you or benefits the business that you work in to really facilitate you know, your future growth. So um, all that said, it's just, uh, just a little bit of, hey, we're here to learn and we're here to do stuff together, so let's do that. Uh, yeah, so thanks guys uh, for having me. This is uh, amazing. This is my first time on B-Size KC. Um, this facility is fantastic. The, the amount of people blows my mind. I think I heard originally a couple weeks ago, like, oh, we're, we're thinking around 500 and see over 750 people have signed up. It's just phenomenal. Absolutely. Very, very, very cool. And the breath that you guys are covering is fantastic too. Medical devices, car hacking, uh, very stoked to be here. Um, so my name is Craig Smith. I am a research director of transportation security at Rapid uh, 7. So what that basically means is if it's a plane, train, automobile, maritime equipment, really any kind of device that moves and has electronics falls into my wheelhouse. Uh, be it research or be it dealing with DC and policies and whatnot, the whole gamut. Uh, I also direct the Car Hackers Handbook and a bunch of other um, open source tools. We'll talk about some of them today. And uh, Fred, I'd like to be your favorite piece as well. Um, so my name's Fred. Uh, I, uh, I have a company called Packet Sled. Uh, we focus on uh, network visibility and, and automation and things that go along that. But a lot of that focus on brief response and investigation and helping establish IT and OT uh, consolidation efforts to really do instant response well. And so it's a lot of time doing a lot of brief response in a lot of places, countries I'd never go again if I didn't have to. Anyway, the focus of that all being about, you know, sort of lowering the poverty line of, of doing the right things when something bad happens to you. And so, uh, for this talk, we're going to talk about, well, the point here makes part of it, uh, but it's also more about going into the physical realm and how to do the, the right to and blue teaming and how to defending. Um, I, I see that we're very, very good as a security community at attacking things and pretending things that are on the internet. We know Ethernet, we know Internet Protocol very well. As long as it's on the internet, we seem to have a good understanding of the work. Um, for instance, we have a lot of tools, we have a lot of frameworks, um, and just years and years of experience. Now, however, we tend to fall short whenever it comes to things outside of uh, Ethernet related stuff, the internet connected things. So our, we find our tools are just kind of leads us out of scope, but we, we miss a lot of stuff. And so we need to bridge that gap between some of the digital internet world and the physical realm, which is still considered security and in scope. For instance, you have your, your gate controls, your car systems, your medical devices. Um, you have your alarm systems, of, you know, even for things like game consoles and stuff have security and stuff in them. Um, they're definitely, they should be considered in scope, they affect, you know, your, corporate environment, your home environment, your safety, and we need to be able to include those in the same amount of tests, the same quality of tests, on those types of devices, on these physical devices that we would on, let's say, a server or a website. So hardware companies, for the most part, came with, um, from this group, doing a lot of mechanical things, you know, the electronic discrete logic chips, you know, they basically actuated the relays and things of that nature, and then as time progressed, they got smaller and smaller, we move to microcontrollers, or MCUs, or FPGAs, I think, in this picture. And so that made it, one, more cheaper and more flexible. But by doing that, you basically have to write firmware for microcontrollers, or FPGAs. And firmware is basically just software. And when you have software, you're going to have software bugs. You're also going to have an attack service and vulnerabilities. 
So those things need to be checked, even if they don't connect to the internet. Now, if they do connect to the internet, that, of course, is relatively simple. Um, we see those in our scanners. If we're scanning an environment that's connected to our network, we'll see them. Um, we'll get at least a piece of the device. You know, may not be able to check like OSRF signals or things of that nature. We can find some of the vulnerabilities that way. And I consider these low hanging fruit. And oftentimes, these are things like maybe some speed that our ICS system has been plugged into the network. Uh, you find it and you can do things with it. Or sometimes they're just some startup that's creating some product. Uh, they do not care about security most of the time. So they're just trying to get something out there to get VC funding. Uh, so after their Kickstarter is done, they get their funding, they usually exit out of the company, and most consumers are left with devices that are easily hackable. Uh, at seven, we don't really call this IoT, Internet of Things. We call it Internet Enabled Devices, or IEDs for short. Um, <laughs> But what about the ones that are not connected to the internet? Right? So when you're dealing with those, we still need a method to kind of look at those and figure out like, what are the vulnerabilities with these things. You know, the gate control, can I just simply replay uh, the gate opening? Uh, does it have rolling codes? Well, how good are they? Uh, is there other ways to trigger this or to make it stay open or things of that nature? Maybe it be jammed. Uh, same with cars. We're seeing a lot of stuff with like, vehicles where you know, we're using relay attacks to steal cars. Um, this is the area right now that we're seeing the kind of the active going maliciously in the cars, just people stealing vehicles. And to know is your vehicle vulnerable, it's still a little bit difficult. Now, from an attacker perspective, from red teaming, we do have certain tools. Um, they're using a stack of these tools, not all of us. Things for dumping memory, things for, um, you know, like Proxmark card, HackRF, Yardstick, um, Tip Whisperer, I mean, lists of different types of uh, tools we use and a whole stack of these things that we you know, put together. Now unfortunately each one of these tools requires their own framework, their own, you know, sometimes even their own specific operating system in order to really use them. And so while the, we have some tools, um, it's not really part of our normal daily scope when we're checking our vulnerabilities. It's not always the easiest thing to, to gather and use if each project is totally different. So this is one of the reasons I built the Metasploit Harbor Bridge. And I chose to use Metasploit because it's mainly a platform that most security people at least have some understanding of, or at least aware of its existence. Uh, but it's a big attack framework. It is mainly based on Ethernet. Yeah. Really good Ethernet, very much nothing else besides that. Uh, it has a couple of things. Now, the hardware bridge that we've told that is to bridge that gap. And so, some people in the security community uh, really prefer Python over Ruby, and so that's one of the reasons they don't particularly necessarily like some of the coding in Metasploit, although Metasploit does support Python now, uh, because of the for last year. Uh, but the Metasploit Harbor Bridge actually allows you to write in any language. And the reason being is because I wanted people who are developing hardware uh, to create Metasploit-enabled uh, compatible devices. So whatever they normally write their, their tool in, be it C or similar or whatever, they can technically make one that fits the API necessary for the Harbor Bridge and just and if the vendor doesn't want to support you, uh, that's also fine. Uh, if you get the tool, you can actually modify, well, not really modify, but kind of wrap around the tool and make it work with it anyway. And we do this by talking on whatever the button we're going to talk to. So maybe it's connected to a serial cable, or maybe it's USB, or whatever. Whatever piece of hardware box to your computer on. You talk to it the same way, and then you translate the data into the API. So we usually call these relays. So we have a couple of relays already going on this uh, there's one that's built into the, the main module space. And so when you're in the MFS, or MFS, uh, when you're in the console, the, you can basically just you know, tap and clean out to the uh, local hardware bridge. And this is a Linux socket can uh, kind of proof of concept uh, server. It's a relay. And it will use can utility. You have to have that installed. Uh, but you can run the server. You can talk to it. You can talk on the CAN bus. That's what vehicles use. Uh, if you go to the actual folder system, <coughs> there is a tools hardware folder. Uh, and that there's another Ruby version. Uh, this one's called ELM 327. Uh, that ELM 327 is based on these dongles. These dongles are like $10 to $20. Uh, they're relatively cheap. You can them on eBay. It's free to take your cell phones and you, um, you know, uh, monitor your gas mileage or whatever. Um, but with this relay, what you can do is you can run that sort for so you don't need a, a very expensive can sniffing tool, you can actually use just an extended art tool with the exact same vulnerabilities, uh, testing and validation testing, uh, that you would any, any kind of technology. That one's also Ruby. 
And the same folder that's running Python, uh, going for killer B, and that uses the killer B framework for Zigbee. So if you're going Zigbee testing, all the hardware that's supported by uh, killer B is supported now in Metasploit, and you can make modules and tests for this, that'll work across the board. Uh, if you want to do raw RF signals, you can use RF cat. And RF cat, that line uh, doesn't necessarily come with the Metasploit framework per se. Uh, for that one, you just get the, the one of the latest tools up for RF cat. And it will have a relay built into it. So in the binary folder, there's a RF cap relay, uh, and that just works with this one as well for all RF signals. And then um, there's a new one I wrote a couple weeks ago, uh, written in Rust. And so I don't know if anyone knows a Rust fan. Um, I, I, it's C like. Um, it has a lot more security around it. Um, pretty cool framework, not always the easiest to work with, um, but I do kind of like it. Uh, so this is my first major attempt at using Rust, so you know, feel free to flame me for it. Um, it definitely could be broken down into crates and whatnot, but it is functional. Uh, it is for automotive, uh, Linux socket can. It does not require can utils to be on it. You can just directly talk to can. Um, this is mainly written because I was I needed a model for the Beagle Go to Black. Uh, there is a prototype tape coming out uh, from Machina, the M2 and 3, I don't know what the prototype name is, can be. Um, but we basically wanted to make a mess with it. So we wanted a binary to run on that without being metasploit, and those kinds of things. So that's what that's for. There's an extra side benefit to having a binary version of the relay. Um, this is not officially supported by Rapid7 or Metasploit. Um, that's another reason why it's under my zombie crack name here. Um, you can take this binary and if you want, increase your kill chain with it. Um, so if you pop a shell on an infotainment, it's like your navigation system, or if you pop a shell on like anything has canvas on like aviation or something. Well, don't do aviation. But you something else. Um, you, you can then push the binary to that device, uh, this relay, and then basically relay it directly into the hardware and do raw hand communications through it. Uh, so in the past, the other ones were really setting up a lab environment. Uh, technically, the binary, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. Uh, this isn't, again, something that's just a metaphor that just one click away, but if you are testing out uh, some theory of, you know, like what could somebody do ultimately with with this type of access, maybe doing a demo. Um, oftentimes when we do vehicle assessments, our in demo is to demonstrate us unlocking and starting a car from our to laptop. And so for that final feature or something like that. So that's set up there for you if you guys want it. Um, and now to deploy airbags. So I'm going to demo this in a second. Um, but what we have is there was some research done about a year ago. And this was out in Germany. I met with uh, these two researchers and um, we were, just, we were both simultaneously doing some Arabic research. Uh, we kind of set apart together. I'll write the Metasploit piece for them and we'll look at the research. And what they were looking at is the salvage routine. So vehicles have a salvage routine. And the idea is that if you take your car to a junkyard, and that car's going to be crushed and compacted down, you have to detonate all the airbags first. And all those pyrotechnics in there before you do this. And so there's a tool called PDT. And you plug in, pyrotechnic, something, I don't know what it is, but it, it detonates. And there's a standard for how that tool works. And so they were kind of looking through this, and we got one of our airbag controllers. And so the first thing, the way it works, is it goes through, queries all the airbags, how many airbags are in your car, and then it goes, all right, well, I'm going to arm these devices. So it asks for security access token. The way it works, is the, the uh, airbag controller will give you a seed value. You run your secret sauce algorithm, give it a response value. So when it has that, when it cracks, it arms the devices, and you can deploy them. So, so they start looking through this, and they ask for their seed value, and get their seed number, and it's a one byte number. It's like, oh, well, that's a short key space. Like, okay, this shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> so they're, they're like, oh, we're, we're gonna have a research paper here. <laughs> and so they got that going, and then they started looking a little bit harder, and they realized that, oh, this is just a once complement algorithm. So you kind of see that in that inside that you can make it out. It's basically when you have your binary ones and zeros, if you just invert the ones and zeros, that's your answer. So you can actually do this in your head. And that's actually what they were doing. So when they, when they make the request and they get their, their number, uh, a quick way is just, like, what would you need to add to that number to get to 255? That's the inverse. Um, so you can just do this in your head. Um, they're like, oh, that's really crazy. So they went back over their, the, the, the standard. And they're, they're kind of following the standard. They see in the standard, said, OK, when you're requesting security access token, you know, run your secret sauce algorithm. Like, for example, this one's complement equation. And they're like, oh, I see what happened. They just cut and pasted this. So they were kind of curious to see, like, oh, well, who else has done this? So they went and got some other vendors, 
turns out we all did this. We all cut and pasted this one complement number. <laughs> so there's a CVE for this. Uh, it's actually considered low risk. Uh, the reason why it's considered low risk is because, based on the standard, uh, it, it's not supposed to deploy if you go above uh, 25 miles per hour. So at speed, it shouldn't deploy. Now, I say supposed to, um, because nobody really tested this from the security community yet. And that's kind of what I'm waiting for. Maybe it's to be. But it, the, the thing that I'm sure probably does work is if you follow that standard and you, you go down the line, you say authorize, you know, and then you know, screw up your airbags. Uh, if it goes, oh, what's my speed? Oh, I'm 30 miles an hour. I'm not going to do that. That probably works. I'm hoping that works. Really hope that works. Um, but what I'm curious about is if you were to go down, you authorize your device, and then you send a bunch of spoof packets saying, like, oh, I'm, I'm not driving right now. And then you say detonate. Will it? Um, we don't have the answer to that one yet. So if anyone wants to take a new research paper, that's an easy one. We're going to go over the other one. Okay, go ahead. So that's what comes with this. Um, we're going to demo this. And so that's what comes with uh, this thing right here. If you have the latest version, that's what you have this module. Uh, it does not detonate the airbag at the end. Uh, and what actually wasn't my legal tool this time uh, to stop that one. It was the one from that university. <laughs> the university just didn't want to be associated with it if we detonated it. So uh, that's missing. There's a one missing line. And if you had to reverse engineer that line, just read the standard. It's the last line. <laughs> copy that out and over. So I'm going to do a demo. We're going to do a simulated environment. We're not going to actually dem you know, detonate an airbag here because it might be shrapnel. Um, so we'll, we'll do a simulated one. Demo. Let's get back to one right now. Demo. So I have a couple things here. The simulation I'm currently running on a thing that's what we call carrying Carabill. And I'm going to probably make this easier to do. Let's see. But Karen Caribou is just a tool, it's an open source tool, it supports modules. Um, and I have a couple modules, so if I go to the US, this one, these are the modules. PCU is the one that uh, doesn't come standard with Karen Caribou, it's just one that we use for testing at Metasploit. Uh, and that's my RAP7 to ensure that you know, we haven't broken any of our modules. Um, so it's just, we're just going to, you don't need this one, you can use your actual airbag. So all we do, we have a virtual CAN interface too. So if you're not familiar with Linux, there's a VCAN interface. It's just, it's just like one of the VA car. Um, so you just use that one. So that's right. All these tools are freely available and free to pull down um, via GitHub. And it's all links in here uh, to that as well. So uh, you guys can pull down all these things and, and run your own tests as well. Uh, maybe not the vehicle you drive every day, but... Um, I took a rental car here. <laughs> That's it. There you go. There you go. So I also have, this is the, the rest version of the MSF Relay. Uh, really just a fun argument, which is what uh, interface will listen to, like can, or you can listen to me and you want. Uh, we're going to do virtual can, so we're going to other streams. Absolutely horrible. That's just debugging output. But, you know, you just ask the trigger because it's right. Uh, how, how else would I do this? Um, actually, it's a Rust control. Or not. Alright, so we're going to run uh, this one now. So what we have basically going, we have an airbag uh, simulator going. We have a virtual CAN interface that simulates the network inside the vehicle. We have a Metasploit relay, which is the Rust, that will talk between CAN and Ethernet. Now we're just going to talk local host here, but you could actually do this remotely. And so the only module we need to run is under auxiliary, client, uh, harbor bridge connect. And there's settings for this, um, lots of stuff for evasion and things on, on the network. Uh, for us, we just need to report uh, the default for this wrong for my last point. It's actually on 14,000. And that's it, the rest of this work, so I'm just going to run it. Just go through the next. All right, you know the connection, you get the little notice there saying about the the matrix and all actions on this harbor bridge. And Little consequences, blah, blah, blah. That my order didn't even put it. Um, so that, that's our warning for anything you tag. Whenever you talk to physical hardware, you get that extra little leaving the matrix blur. So it's also paying our It's good. So you can do sessions here, play the interpreter. It shows up in the same area of the interpreter would show up as, but the, the, the type is hardware. And you just 
jump on that session, get your own help. They'll automatically load um, commands based on the page of hardware detail function. So in this case, it's uh, automotive. It's like what RF and CRF commands. Uh, you do both. You do both. Um, this is automatically detected and negotiated on connections. So here we should only have one support bus. Uh, let's just say connect to that one. Uh, this is just a convenience command. Uh, it just means that every command I run after this will run on that bus. So if they have multiple buses, it will solve our problem through them. It specifies a parameter at the time. So the modules are under host uh, hardware. And you can tap into this on the uh, We're going to run PDT. We're going to do the install. There's not a whole lot of options in this particular one. This is where you get some more information. This is where the, the actual research paper's at, all that good stuff. Um, because I said connect up, I don't really need to you know, specify any parameters. It just work. Oh, I'll also load up um, some Canvas to connect to so, okay. right, so this is just going to, of course, the packets we can see them. So you can see what they are, so I'll talk about them later. Um, so if you run this, this is what it's going to do. It's going to go out, it's going to query the uh, airway controller, have some information about it, and it's going to try to authenticate it. And success. So what we have here, we get the VIN number here is on your vehicle's VIN, it's the airway controller's VIN. It can pull out all of the different airbags that you might have in a system, I'll post about 11 or so of these airbags. You can individually pick which airbag you want to deploy, or you can deploy them all. Um, not, not, not in this one, like I said, the parts missing, but it's just one command afterwards. Um, and there's a security access key that gets in there and, it, and it attempts it and gets success. And this actually leaves the vehicle in a state of ready to deploy. Uh, if you really want it to, I, right now we suggest just turning off the car. Um, but yeah, this is a good way of just making sure that you, if your car has this particular issue, as far as I know, it's your car does right now, um, so you can verify it. And so with this, we're going to use this as our example as how to do like some red team, blue team stuff. So I'm going to put it back in the slides and then just kind of see it. Oh, here's the, here's the canvas. Uh, I don't know if that's sexy to anybody, but it's pretty much like just an egg. Is, is that sexy to anybody? Am I, am I can? Okay. Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> so, very simple, not a whole lot to it. Um, eight byte packets, uh, relatively easy to reverse engineer. Uh, it, it does look like garbage. Uh, uh, I'm not going to explain to you what these are. But uh, if you were to take the standard sheet and look at it, it would, it would follow this exactly. So, what it says to do with standards, these are the bytes that it says to send. So, this isn't really super complicated. I wish that was back. Your slides. Here we go. Can you have this back? Um, does anybody understand um, the cars analogy here? Eighties. Thank you. Okay, more than can, so that's good. Um, the reason why this is important is largely because the environment we live in today is, you know, sort of the end of the road on the on the I drive my car. Anybody saw that that X Files episode where basically AI took over everything and, and so on and so forth? We're you know, 10 to 12 years away from being, you know, subordinate to a greater intelligence than us. In the short time, you know, we have some liability and legal implications that prevent, you know, AI overwatch from taking over until they do all the integrated risk management for us. And then, anyways, that's an end game. I'm sorry I brought my children into this world. Um, the way to think about this is what we're talking about here on the bus is not just on in cars. And so, as Craig talked about, it's, and transportation, there's an awful lot of places where these types of signals are both interesting because it's a new place for us to capture this information. I mean, popping airbags is cool. It's a safety thing. Uh, realistically, but there's safety things in every device that has a sensor on it that provides some interface to, you know, some action, whether it be, you know, running a ship aground or it's GPS or it's how, how much fuel do I have left from the guy that's, you know, driving my truck from his house and. Kansas City, um, you know, to Seattle, but not actually in the cab, and you know all of these things. So it's a very real situation. So it's it's cool to do something interesting like I'm going to deploy some airbags in any car that I choose, but it's also really relevant. Um, so quick public service announcement here. Um, I don't want to get into the red team or blue team thing. I think the way that um, we think about it is every time you do something from an attacker's perspective, you should do it from a defender's perspective. It's the same thing. 
use the same technology, use the same tool set, practice that tool set, practice those other things that you've got, oftentimes you'll find that it improves both sides of the coin. Um, you know, and, and in reference to this, imagine that you're a guy that's working against somebody that wrote uh, you know, an exploit for something they spent three months on, and you're a defender, you haven't seen it before, and you don't know anything about that thing anyway. So what do you do? You know, you're kind of in a tough situation. The key thing here is you may see uh, behaviors and execution that happens that you know are well path in the ways you think about all things. Um, this particular type of threat is, is different than other types of things, but I'm going to approach it in the same way. And the first thing is I'm going to spend the time to look through and understand the tools and, and technologies that happen as a function of that. So if you have somebody come in and do a compromise assessment and you know they've given you the 320 page report on, you know, I just popped everything here and owned your domain controllers and I'm super awesome and maybe cats and period math. Then you also know that the challenge is you didn't learn anything from that exercise, right? So, you know, one of the great examples is Craig's built all these tools that allow you to execute those things. So when you finally get an understanding, like let's take for the the sake of argument that somebody just deployed airbags in a truck that I'm monitoring because it's an autonomous system and I have to understand what happens here and whether or not that was malicious or not. You know, then we get into a conversation about what we do about it. So, you know, I don't know anything about this stuff because I didn't write all the tools and I'm not a hacksaw, right? So, for that moment, I've got to really start to understand what happened here. Um, and the first thing is, you know, in this particular case, as an example, I want to see the attack that Craig ran. So before we're playing the, you know, I'm on the side of the chessboard and you're on that one, it's in working in concert. So we deployed some airbags, okay, cool. What does that look like? We can see what that looks like specifically. I need to figure out if I can determine in that process what made sense. So I can build some detections or preventive uh, controls around it, or even just understand what happened. And so, you know, in doing that, one of the things that is great about standards is you know, I can maybe not understand what this looks like or what it is, but when I look to take some of the things off the virtual interface and take what we saw and then map that based on what the standard tells me, I can get an understanding of what looks like what that trap is supposed to do because that's what the standard says to do. And so, you know, everything should operate as the standard dictates, right? Most of the time. Um, in this particular case, it becomes something where in a pile of traffic, I have a very clear understanding of what's happening because of my, you know, snippet of time here. And I could go into a little bit of detail here, I will, but when you look at this structure and each of these, because this isn't a very big, uh, you know, bite size, it isn't that all that terribly difficult to reverse. And so even a guy like me can do that. So um, when we start to investigate specifically what we're looking for and, and look at the mappings and some of the tools that Craig uh, mentioned, um, I can tell you what is affecting a particular, this isn't the, maybe the right ones, right? Um, yeah, anyway, so the, the zero one here basically says this is the, the driver's side um, front airbag, and here, you know, what's illustrated is this is a laser. This is a laser. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, what we know here is when I add this combination, I get a. Every time I see something positive, I get an addition of a, a 400 here for the second uh, bite, and so I can see that in this case, right here, I have some actual correct behavior happening where I'm deploying airbags. Now, I don't know whether or not that's legit or, or illegit, but again, I'm just trying to decipher. You know, in the background, what's happening here after somebody called me and said they destroyed a truck of mine and, you know, millions of dollars is getting where it's supposed to go. So, airbags are deployed. Okay, I found the airbags. So, that's good. And then here, I know exactly what was called here. So, from a signal perspective, I have the ability to basically do something and put it back into a system where I can evaluate every single time when I look at that traffic, that network traffic off the can, successfully understanding when, that, when that's transpiring. So I can also tell you that if it doesn't have the right sequence, in essence, that's going to be something that I want to make sure I'm going to do some diligence on right away. So here, tools of the empire. So these are all tools that Craig used um, in conjunction. 
can generate uh, the, the candy tools is kind of industry uh, standard, I would say. And I think you can do anything that you want, anything that you think you can do with Wireshark or you know, TCP Dump or you know, any of these other uh, very commonplace tools is what you would do here with Canon. So you can also generate a, a, a large amount of traffic to validate and assert. I can also craft packets by way of doing that using these same tools so that I can sniff those and I can get passed into, into the specific of, um, of the protocols below that I can also utilize in the same tools. So if I want to get more than just sort of can header information, I want to look deeply into the, the underlying protocols, then I can do that too. Um, in my particular case, you know, we think about this, the exercise here isn't just the, hey, it's cool, again, you know, we, we, we pop some airbags, but um, do any of you guys remember the Scantron tests from high school, maybe college, maybe younger, if you're younger, that's fine. Okay, so you know how, how they grade those, they put a cover sheet on top of all of the answers, and then they check all the ones that are, you know, correct. They don't check the incorrect ones next to it or the things that are affected by it. Right? And so when I take that off, when we look at what we deal with in security, all of my edge cases are all the other answers other than the right ones. Right? And so what I want to understand is, are there any permutations of what Craig just demonstrated here that are potentially affected? So again, in the case of like an autonomous truck, I would like to know if any of the automated systems are both subject to this type of behavior as well as something else. Like is the driver's side airbag the most critical one there? Or is it the passenger side airbag? and which one of those things are, are provide implications that have significantly further ranging effects than just maybe I'm you know, gonna have a really bad problem with my net for the next 10 years. Um, it maybe it, it does something in the safety side of things. So you take those things and you put them into the software development cycle, right, as a, as a blue team guide. It's great for you to do triage and instant response. However, if you're not feeding that back into the product itself or the vendor itself, as a function of that, that you're doing both yourself and the vendor in the service, and you should compare that with real data. So I, I grabbed a particular set of, of, uh, of packets here, and I said, okay, well, this, this is interesting for me. I want to manifest that on this sensor technology that I have here to make sure that that doesn't happen, and I could do that. Um, the next part of that is make sure that I'm providing the coverage of that in my testing procedure, again, as a blue teamer. It's not just whether or not you're looking at uh, triaging traffic in a sim, it's the whole life cycle of security. Um, you know, so cars are cool, but um, GPS is cool too. How many of you guys have a GPS? Okay, how many have phones? Okay, so, you know, this is also interesting from that standpoint. When we think about how do I understand what this looks like, the GPS environment, was never designed for what it's being used for today, right? Military grade GPS may be suspect too, we won't get into that here, but uh, commercial GPS and things that people utilize here, this one has some relevance around a, a locomotive, but I mean, in, in, in other cases, it's your phone, it's, it's what you're using to drive cars, it's the Waze app, it's whatever. And understanding what's happening as a function of that is also super critical. Um, we're at Cerner, so I thought it was probably appropriate to Putting some things around, and even though I was I was sort of educated um, a little bit on this last night, I think some of the things around how HL7 operates. You guys are familiar with what HL7 is, right? Okay, cool. If you looked at HL7 on the network, would you understand it? Okay, cool. So you wouldn't know how to defend it. Anyway, the net is these types of things where we get this level of visibility, and the types of tools you can utilize to do that, where red teaming and blue teaming, you know, become critical. It's only this is only relevant if it's exploitable. Right, really. And so as a, as a boot teamer, I care about what is potentially going to bring a system down, cause safety issues, you know, risk of business. And, you know, partnering with somebody like, in, in this case, Craig has been, you know, really both enlightening about what the technology's capabilities are, but also the tools to do it. So uh, the, the last piece of this I wanted to leave with was, you know, make sure uh, boot teamers typically are to as console junkies, right? So I'm going to triage instance, I'm going to make sense of whatever you know chunks of data are coming in. I have incident response requirements, I have these other things. But um, you know, it's really important for them to do research as well. And research isn't just building detections. Research is all these other components, and it gives them 
both the lifeblood of making better security decisions, but also getting an opportunity to work in conjunction with industry leading research that helps manifest more uh, support for the industry. So something like a P sides is an example of where these things get married together as well. Um, I think that's it. Um, if you guys want to get a hold of either one of us, um, please feel free to drop an email. It's absolutely misspelled, and there's no dot com. <laughs> so um, please feel free to drop us an email, hang out the rest of the day, and um, you know get involved. Get involved in the industry. Get involved in today. Um, and if there's other things that you guys are interested in or research you want to hear about, or whatever the case may be. Grab anybody to talk about it, grab us to talk about it. Yeah, I agree. We're going to have time to Yeah. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, but I'm going to have to stop. Um, the piece, what we've been doing with it besides the uh, red team and stuff, is we also have it, we use by blue teams for like Q&A. Um, we put it, especially if you're in a manufacturing area, you're making devices. Um, we will basically install a relay for every Q&A facility is. And so people can sit at the consoles and run their tests every time they're making a new version or something. That's one of the reasons for doing this. Um, you can also build a station where you add things like our you know, RF cat, something like that, to it, or take you do scans of your environment from an RF, from back to not just Wi-Fi. So those are some of the reasons to do it. So the usage of this weight, this hardware bridge, is for blue team as well. So there's any questions about any things we've talked about today? <coughs> oh, you were asking about the safety turning the car off and back on after you've done this test? Yeah, that, that should fix it. So it would put the state back to not being anything. And honestly, when you're closing your car or anything in general, you'll tend to get what's called the Christmas tree effect, where lights are blinking all over the place. Um, and, and, and use it to, as long as you're writing it at the time, it's relatively safe. Um, so you probably won't break your car doing this, uh, but you will have to turn it off and back on. Basically, a reboot for your car. Worst case scenario, just make the battery and put it back on. That probably won't happen to you. <laughs> That's a way to force you to reboot. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so yeah. I have a Bluetooth deal in my car, and someone theoretically do a drive by. Um, well, yes. <laughs> if you have, if you have a Bluetooth dongle in your vehicle, um, oftentimes they have very, very bad authentication on them. And if somebody can talk to them, you have to do this. Sorry. <laughs> you, should, you should check with, definitely continue to check the number of devices that are connected when they're not going. By the way, name them something specific so you know what your devices are. That's all. Um, do you know of uh, anybody out there who is um, making any kind of emulator for the CAN bus or car computers that you could set up in a lab, aka not needing an actual car to test on or a car computer to test yes. on? Yeah, yeah there's, as far as simulations go, there are two. Um, there's one that I wrote, uh, but the one I wrote is mainly for vehicle simulation and diagnostics. Uh, so there's one called uh, UDSO, and that, that one I wrote where what you would do is you'd use a dealership tool, you would program the car and whatnot, you would see that, learn how the car responds, and they can then simulate that. Uh, the goal for that particular project was actually to attack the dealership tool, uh, but it does have a nice side effect of making a virtual car to talk to. Now, it won't, it won't do things like you know, apply vulnerabilities in the car or anything of that nature, it's just communication back and forth. Uh, we might have one that we will release. Uh, we're definitely using the capital flight to share at that time. Uh, we'll have a ECU simulator there, uh, and we may release that as well. Anybody else? Any questions? Awesome. Before you guys jam out, um, two important reminders. One, this room becomes a couple of rooms, almost immediately three rooms. Um, so, I guess it's closing time. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> Thank you.